You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape. You can now access the latest in medical news on your Amazon Alexa-enabled device. Join me, Perry Wilson, every weekday morning for Medscape Medical Minute, where I highlight the top medical stories of the day. To add Medscape Medical Minute to your flash briefing, search for Medscape Medical Minute on Amazon and click Enable. Or open the Amazon Alexa app, go to Skills, search for Medscape Medical Minute, and click Enable. Then say, Alexa, what's the news? Or, Alexa, what's my flash briefing? I hope you'll join us. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology, and this is This Week in Cardiology for March 29th, 2024. This week, the intermittent fasting paper, complicated anticoagulation decisions, heterogeneous treatment effects, frailty in heart failure, the importance of the ECG, and industry conflicts. I think I found some really good studies this week, and I had fun doing this podcast. Let me start with the intermittent fasting brouhaha. Dr. Christopher Labos has a nice essay on heart.org Medscape Cardiology this week about the recent intermittent fasting story. He's a great writer and thinker, but I have a little bit of a different take than his. Now, perhaps you've heard this story. The American Heart Association issued a press release in advance of the AHA EPI meeting, and it detailed an observational study that found an association between people who self-report intermittent fasting and a 91% higher rate of cardiovascular death. Now, there was no simultaneous publication. This was just a poster at a small meeting. And this was about as flawed an analysis as there is. There was self-reported eating patterns when I can hardly recall what or how I ate yesterday, never mind weeks ago. There were surely confounding variables, like all these studies. That is, people who self-report time-restricted eating may be different from those who do not. And Dr. Labos also points out that the authors did 36 statistical comparisons, so the play of chance was also likely. And, And I could go on. It was a flawed paper. But this story has a special twist. One that really bugs me. And here it is. When the paper came out and found that a popular pattern of eating associated with severe harm, and then mainstream media jumped on it, well, now many of the top people in medicine were outraged at the methodological flaws. There was a backlash, and my Twitter feed led up with these top people telling everybody about the problems of non-random observational comparisons. What bothers me about this is that many of these people remain silent when similarly flawed studies come out that find associations that they like. I mean, gulp, gulp. Some of them even publish studies like the one they were publicly shredding. My take is that nearly all of these sorts of studies are too flawed to have A, been done, B, been published, and C, been promoted or covered in the media. What I try and do on this podcast is be neutral in my criticisms of these studies. I don't have any strong feelings about time-restricted eating. I mean, recent studies in New England and JAMA have found no real weight loss effects. What I would propose is that there be equal criticisms for similarly flawed papers. Now, today I'm going to discuss a number of observational studies that were done properly and add important findings to consider for the practice of clinical medicine. The first of these deals with stroke prevention with oral anticoagulation in patients with AF. Now, we have this simple idea that if stroke risk is high enough, we start oral anticoagulation. Now, we determine stroke risk based on the very simple chads vas score. We estimate the yearly untreated stroke risk, then we multiply it times 0.65, or a 65% reduction is how much warfarin reduced stroke risk versus placebo or aspirin in no seminal trials. This is the prevailing thinking. It is what the guidelines say. It is the mainstay of decision aids for oral anticoagulation. But it's super simple, and it makes assumptions that may not be true. One of the major assumptions is that there is no accounting for competing risk of death in these patients. Namely, if a patient with AFib dies of anything one or two years after starting oral anticoagulation, there's going to be a blunting of the five-year efficacy of stroke prevention. And the thing is, death is a common thing that happens after a new diagnosis of AFib. 
There are multiple observational studies that report a 20 to 25% mortality in the first year after an AFib diagnosis, and we've all seen this. Dr. Sachin Shaw and his team at Massachusetts General Hospital had the idea to look at how these competing risks affect the benefit of anticoagulation. Cirque Outcomes published their study. They chose a really neat way to explore this question. They took data from 12 randomized trials, warfarin versus placebo or aspirin trials. The warfarin trials were the only anticoagulation trials that studied anticoagulation versus no anticoagulation. This sort of analysis could not be done with DOACs because recall that the DOAC trials studied anticoagulation with DOACs versus anticoagulation with warfarin. And so for each person in these seminal trials, the authors estimated an absolute risk reduction of warfarin with two methods. One method was to use the guideline-endorsed model. You just multiply 0.65 times the untreated risk, and this was a simple model. Each patient gets a no-treatment stroke risk based on the Freiburg et al. Swedish cohort study. That's where, you know, Chad's VASC of 2 is 2.2% annual risk. They then extrapolated this risk reduction out to five years. But the other method was to use a competing model that used the same Chad's VAS score, but they also accounted for competing risk of death. Now, to determine the risk of death, they used life tables. Well, this gets a little complicated because it involves something called the fine gray extension of the proportional hazard model, which treats death from non-stroke causes as a competing event. Basically, the older and sicker a patient was, the greater chance that non-stroke death would happen. The best way to understand this idea is to picture a graph with years or time on the x-axis and the absolute risk reduction of stroke on the y-axis. And so when you use the simple 0.65 times the untreated stroke rate, you just get this linear line that just goes up. Every year, there's just stroke risk reduction because the yearly risk reduction just increases by that amount over years. By five years, there's about a 10% absolute risk reduction. But with a competing risk model, the amount of risk reduction does not keep going up. It gets attenuated after a year or two because of the competing risk because you can't benefit from stroke reduction with anticoagulation if you die of something else. Now, this was the first big finding, that is, that simple Chad's VASC estimation of the absolute risk reduction overestimates the benefit compared with a model that accounts for death. Now, the actual numbers here were absolute risk reduction with anticoagulation with just a simple Chad's VASC 2 method at three years was 6.9% versus 5.2% when you use the competing risk model, and that was highly significant. They then looked at how life expectancy affected the difference between the simple Chad's VASC model and the competing risk model. Now, if your life expectancy was short, say one to four years, the Chad's VASC model overestimated the benefit by nearly 80%. But if your life expectancy was long, greater than 11 years, up to 47 years, then the competing risk model actually underestimated the benefit compared with the simple model. The bottom line is that they showed that while warfarin was clearly effective, treatment benefit was overstated when using the guideline-endorsed approach because guidelines do not account for the competing risk of death, and guidelines assume a constant growth in treatment benefit over time. And the overestimation was most pronounced in patients with the lowest life expectancy and when the benefit was estimated over a multi-year horizon. Now, I find this a super clever and super important analysis. I, like you, see patients who have advanced age and multiple risk factors for competing risks of death. The older patient has a high CHADS VAS score, so we jump to oral anticoagulation because the stroke risk is high. That's what our charts say, big yellow boxes. Conversely, we see a 55-year-old with, say, hypertension, and we think, oh, that's pretty low risk, and we can hold off on oral anticoagulation. What this kind of analysis does is make us think that younger patients with AFib may live longer, that is long enough to benefit from stroke prevention, uh, and maybe more than the older high-risk patient. Now, I'm not saying this data is enough to act on specifically, but... It's enough to make us think that simple guideline-endorsed recommendations may not fit the older person who has substantial competing risks of death. 
The concept is similar to why I'm increasingly thinking that primary prevention therapies might deliver more benefit to younger, lower-risk people because they have longer to benefit. Now, one important caveat, one that I learned first from Dr. Jeremy Sussman at the University of Michigan, and I learned it on Twitter, Dr. Sussman reminded me that in the same way that anticoagulation benefit is reduced in a competing risk of death model, so is bleeding. In other words, if an early death effectively reduces anticoagulation benefit, early death would also theoretically reduce bleeding risk, because if you die, then you don't have a bleed. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, this is complicated. But I discuss this because competing risks don't get enough attention. And herein is another reason, another reason why I don't love those simple colored boxes and guidelines. Even the decision to use oral anticoagulation is complicated and turns on the characteristics of each patient, as well as, of course, that patient's personal preferences. Now, let me point you to another paper on comorbidity and treatment effects. This paper is entitled, Pivotal Trials May Not Apply to Complex Patients, and it came out last month. My buddy Andrew Foy and his team at Penn State have this another analysis that expands on this competing risk of death analysis that I just told you about. They did an analysis of eight big cardiovascular RCTs that had open data. They explored the relationship of comorbidity to treatment effect. And they looked at the ACCORD trials, AFFIRM, Berry Revascularization, SCUDHEF, SPRINT, two TIMI trials, trials that you recognize. Now, they had the source data of these eight trials. They could apply what's called the Charleston Comorbidity Index, which is a way of quantifying the degree of comorbidity. That They wanted to see how that comorbidity index affected treatment effect from the trial. Now, trialists typically do this with subgroups, right? But a subgroup is just one factor, say diabetes or no diabetes, male, female, creatinine greater than 1.5 or less than 1.5. But the Charleston Comorbidity Index accounts for a lots of things. And so what they found is that, A, most trials enroll patients with low comorbidity scores and little variability of the comorbidity scores. We know that, but they showed it nicely. Their second finding was that about a third of trials had clinically relevant interactions between the comorbidity index and treatment effect. I'll just give you a few for instances, and they have a beautiful discussion, and it's in the American Journal of Medicine. For instance, in the SCUDHEV trial, the majority of ICD treatment benefit was in patients with low comorbidity scores. In a firm, the rate versus rhythm in patients with AFib, which found the non-significant 15% higher rate of death in the rhythm control arm, there was accentuated harm, even more harm, from rhythm control in those who had high comorbidity indexes. Now, Foy's paper is in the American Journal of Medicine. I'll link to it. It's an eye-opener. I did an interview with him when he presented this at the ACC in 2023, and we'll have a link to that. In their discussion section, they actually point out why the interactions could have occurred. Usually, the explanation is similar to the competing risk of anticoagulation study, namely that you have to consider not only the probability of treatment benefit, but you also have to consider the probability of treatment harm and the probability of the patient having the primary outcome event, as well as the probability of a competing event. Now, this amalgam of this stuff is what clinicians do. It's why robots can't practice medicine. And I actually love the idea of having to consider all of these complex probabilities. It is exactly why clinic days are harder than days when all I do is isolate PVs in the EP lab. All right, another paper along the same lines, this one looking at frailty and heart failure and causes of death. Cirque Outcomes published this important paper on competing risk. This one, a Japanese group reported data from a registry called the Fragile HF Cohort. Older patients who were hospitalized for heart failure in 15 hospitals in Japan. Their goal was to study the association between multi-domain frailty and cause of death. They follow up uh, was two years. They first set out three causes of death, heart failure death, other cardiovascular deaths, say, from coronary disease or stroke, uh, and then non-cardiovascular death. 
they made three categories or domains of frailty. One was a physical domain, one was a social domain, and one a cognitive domain of frailty. They had about 1,200 patients total, mean age 81. Now just stop there for a second. This is the most common age of heart failure patients I see at my busy community hospital. 45% of patients had zero or one domain of frailty. 37% had two frailty domains, and 18% had three frailty domains. The main findings were that a greater number of frailty domains were associated with a higher rate of all-cause death. That's obvious. As the number of frailty domains increased, the prevalence of sudden death, stroke death, death due to non-cardiovascular causes, and unknown death numerically increased, whereas that of death due to heart failure decreased. Only non-cardiovascular death and not heart failure death and other cardiovascular death were significantly associated with the number of frailty domains. And finally, in a competing risk analysis with ejection fraction as an adjustment variable in addition to age and sex, they found that heart failure with preserved ejection fraction was more prevalent in those with a greater number of frailty domains. Now, my comments. I highlight this paper not only because it is a good use of observational data, but mainly because it stays with the theme this week of thinking about the complexity of patients with heart failure. Guidelines want us to put these patients into boxes. Hef, ref, give the four drugs. Hef, pef, start Sacubitril, Valsartan, and SGLT2 inhibitors. But many of these patients have heart failure and, and other things. Cardiologists aren't trained in frailty. I've never used a frailty score. But I'm not sure that matters because when we walk into a hospital room, we ought to be able to recognize it. You can ask what this patient does. Do they get up physically? What's their physical status? Are they socially frail? You can ask about cognition. Ask yourself this question. Would this patient you're seeing right now been randomized into one of those seminal trials which included mostly stable ambulatory outpatients? If your patient has one or more of these frailty domains, it's likely that they face a non-cardiovascular cause of death. I say congratulations to Cirque Outcomes for publishing such nice papers recently and to this Japanese group first author, Dr. Kochi Ohashi. All right, next topic is the importance of the 12-lead ECG in choosing uh, EP procedures. I went into cardiology because of the pure beauty of the ECG. A group from the University of Chicago publishing in JAMA Cardiology has a useful paper on the importance of notches on the ECG. The background goes like this. Left bundle branch block is a problem for heart patients because when the left bundle is blocked, activation of the RV down the right bundle happens first. Activation of the RV then causes contraction, so we get the RV contracting first. Then, muscle-to-muscle -muscle conduction occurs from right to left, and left ventricular activation occurs later. This causes LV contraction after RV contraction, dyssynchrony. On echo, it looks like a swinging or bouncing heart. The dyssynchrony between ventricles can be terrible, as it can cause or worsen LV function and exacerbate heart failure. CRT, or cardiac resynchronization therapy, should be considered 100% electrical therapy. By placing pacing leads in the RV and LV, and the LV epicardium is accessed via the coronary sinus, you can now pace both ventricles simultaneously. This bi-V pacing synchronizes the ventricles. On the ECG, one feature of a left bundle branch block is that it is wider than normal. I will come back to that soon as it is at the core of the University of Chicago author's work. Now, conduction system pacing via the His bundle or the left bundle area also treats the RV-LV dyssynchrony by directly capturing the conduction system, which then leads to simultaneous activation of both ventricles. But, but, here is the rub. The QRS can be wide and left bundle branch appearing on the ECG, and it is not due to delay in the conduction system. This happens when the problem is delayed conduction through the myocardium or muscle. We call this an IVCD or interventricular conduction delay. 
In this case, the conduction system is fine, but the muscle is diseased and the conduction of electricity through the heart proceeds slowly through the diseased uh, muscle and the QRS is still wide. It looks like a left bundle. Conduction system pacing will not work for this problem because conduction system pacing can only correct block in the conduction system. The muscle-to-muscle -muscle conduction is downstream from the conduction system. Actually, in this case, it's also hard for standard BIV pacing to correct this issue as well. So IVCD occurs commonly, often in patients with heart failure or LVH or many other myocardial diseases. Therefore, what we have to do as cardiologists is decide if the wide QRS is due to bad muscle conduction or due to conduction system disease. Enter the University of Chicago group, which they have previously done very elegant recordings of the left side of the septum, wherein they can actually show with a multipolar catheter the site of block in the left bundle branch. Their earlier papers were led by Dr. Rod Tung. This new paper which has absolutely gorgeous images, harness the value of those left bundle recordings to help sort out new ECG criteria for left bundle branch block. Let me try and do a brief summary of this recent work. They had about 75 patients who, on baseline ECG, had a left bundle branch block appearing QRS pattern. Then they had these left bundle recordings done during an EP study for something else. A little more than half of these patients had true block in the left bundle branch, and the others had normal conduction in the bundle. Right there, you know that not every left bundle branch block appearing QRS has true block in the conduction system. Then they did correlations looking for the most predictive ECG patterns that would identify, that sensitivity, the true conduction block, and correctly identify the non-conduction block IVCD cases, that specificity. They found that a very simple measure that worked best was the time to notch in lead one of greater than 75 milliseconds. Remember that left bundle branch blocks have notches in lead one. That's nice because it is an easy measure. The sensitivity and specificity of this criteria were not perfect, but the specificity, probably the more important value because we don't want to implant devices in patients that won't benefit, was far better than the standard criteria, which we call the Strauss criteria. But then they weren't done. That they called the derivation co cohort. Cleverly, they came up with a validation cohort of patients. And for this, they used post-TAVI patients who acquired a new left bundle branch block. This was super clever because post-TAVI left bundle branch block is mostly always due to impingement on the left bundle. That is, its true conduction block. Here, the sensitivity was 87%. But there were also 10 of these post-TAVI left bundle branch block patients who had a pre-procedural IVCD that looked like a left bundle branch block. In these patients, the time to notch of greater than 75 milliseconds criteria correctly identified the IVCD from true left bundle in all cases. In other words, 100% specificity. My comments. This is brilliant work that is not only methodologically sound, but clinically relevant. We as clinicians need to be able to identify true conduction block versus IVCD on the ECG. For this, we do not need AI, genetic scores, advanced imaging. We simply need to understand the heart's anatomy and physiology and be skilled in reading one of cardiology's most important tools, the inexpensive and no-risk 12-lead EKG. The University of Chicago authors have helped us better distinguish true conduction block. That is really important as it informs common decisions about the type of electrical therapy to consider in patients with heart failure. I say congratulations to them. And I also want to compare this sort of foundational electrical work with the ablation side of EP. I worry about the ablation side of our field. Here, instead of doing foundational work, we seem enamored by, perhaps distracted by, better ways to destroy left atrial myocardium for AFib ablation. I've got these Google alerts in my Twitter feed. It overflows with marketing for different ways to obliterate left atrial cells in the name of capturing more of the AF ablation market. My hope for the AFib side of EP is to take a cue from the foundational work done in CRT therapies, such as that done by the University of Chicago team.
I've been ablating AFib now for 20 years, and we still have not a clue what causes this condition. We have no clue about the best strategies to ablate AFib. We have no proper sham-controlled trials of AF ablation. What we have now are $9,000 ablation catheters rather than $3,000 ablation catheters. I don't see that as progress. Now, speaking of industry, may I point you to a brief JAMA research letter that I co-authored this week. It's titled Industry Payments to U.S. Physicians by Specialty and Product Type, and this is a very short segment. Full credit for this work goes to Dr. Ahmed Saeed, an aspiring young doctor in Cairo who plans a career in cardiology. Co-authors of this paper included major academics Joe Ross, Lisa Lehman, and Andrew Foy. Ahmed was a force of nature doing this work and doing the many revisions. This paper took data from the Open Payments platform from 2013 to 2022. Importantly, we only included cash and non-cash equivalents. Royalties and research funds were excluded. Finding number one, industry paid out $12 billion, billion to U.S. doctors. Finding two, about 57% of doctors received at least one payment from industry. I'll make a note there, so there are actually lots of non-conflicted doctors. Finding three, payments varied widely across specialties. The highest payments went to ortho, neuropsych, and cardiology was third with $1.3 billion. Finding four, across all specialties, the average median physician received only $10 to $100, whereas top earners often received more than $1 million. And finding five, we showed the 25 medical products with the most payments, separated by drugs and devices. The top drugs that involved payments, rivaroxaban and apixaban, were one and two, hundreds of millions of dollars. Number five and six on the list, EMPA and DAPA. You know what wasn't on the list? Spernolactone, metoprolol. The top device by a ton was a da Vinci surgical system. Cardiac devices included on that list, wait for it, the Evolute aortic valve, impella, life vest, and watchman. You know what wasn't on the list of devices? The 3830 pacing lead used for conduction system pacing. My comments, this research letter is not going to solve the problem of profit-driven medicine. In fact, I am not against profits, as profits can lead to innovation. But the sheer amount of money going to doctors is astounding, and it makes me think do take a look at the JAMA publication. It's super short. Let me know what you think. And I want to just one sentence preview of next week. Lancet has published a paper on diabetes risk with statins. We'll talk about that. The University of Pennsylvania EP group has published a super interesting paper on using type 1C antiarrhythmic drugs to suppress PVCs in, get this, patients with advanced heart disease. So we'll talk about that as well. That's it for this week in cardiology. As always, I'm grateful that you listened. Thank you. And remember, if you like this podcast, please take the time, give us a rating, write us a review. If you have something you disagree with, let me know in the comments. I'm always happy to learn from these comments. Until next week, this is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape.